Welcome to another Unwinding with Fiber and Fabric. I'm so glad to be back after a few weeks break. I have been busy, but I decided I was going to work on a, work out my 2021 ideas and goals a little bit before I jumped back into a video. As we entered into the new year, I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to proceed. I have a, a ton, always, I have always have a ton of projects I want to try, new techniques, revisiting old techniques, and as always, a huge stack of wool that I need to spin and a huge stack of quilts that I need to quilt. And figuring out the balance of my time between my different projects and the learning of something new, well, it can sometimes be daunting. Sometimes it's nice to just leap in and sometimes it's nice to do a little planning ahead of time. And I've been trying to balance a little bit of that. I've uh, been quilting quite a bit and I have finished, I'll put a picture right here. Um, I, I've finished a project that I've been working on <sighs> for nearly 20 years. <laughs> uh, I am so pleased. My husband is now curled up under this quilt every evening as we watch TV. The cats adore it. Um, it had started out as a project that I was going to do for my son. My son is completely happy with the idea that it's now wrapped around his dad. There's a type of quilting project known as Quilts of Valor and they're ten they tend to be very patriotic in color and scheme. Well, this quilt works out to be his his quilt of valor. My husband retired from the military a couple years ago, and um, he has you know served served the the country diligently and well. But he's not really a big red, white, and blue person. So this quilt has been perfect. It celebrates his time in the Air Force, his time serving um, serving his country, and I'm glad to have it done. But as I wrapped up this ongoing put aside many times, actually took it apart and started all over again with the quilting um, of this quilt, it made me start thinking, thinking back to some of the early things that I did. And one of the things that kept coming back as, as two themes um, that I kept running into both in my own personal life and also when I follow social media, and people who are saying, oh, I want to get into quilting, and it's maybe one of their their 2021 goals, is that we're always way too critical about the projects we, we make. And even though we hear the three-foot rule, if it looks okay from three feet, we should be happy, uh, we have a tendency to, to still self-criticize. Um, and we tend to look at the work of people who've been quilting for a long time and then find our, our, our efforts lacking, not realizing that they too started out somewhere. So that's one of the things that has been on my mind um, a bunch. And, and that concept goes across, whether it's spinning or knitting or crochet or quilting or beading or painting, any kind of creative pursuits. Um, I know for my husband, as he does woodworking, it's always a matter of, of we see this, this wonderful pieces that others have made and then we look at our own pieces and, and we feel inadequate, imperfect. And so that's, that's one thing that, that 2021 has, has really brought to the forefront of my mind that I want to uh, address. The second thing is a lot of people say, well, where do I start? And everyone says, oh, go to YouTube videos or go here or, or somewhere. And that's all great. But a lot of projects are designed really for advanced beginners and intermediate. You get on the two ends, the beginners and the advanced, and there's less projects because beginner quilts are just really basic. And a lot of people won't put their time and effort into something that is really basic to create to sell they want something that grabs the eye they want something that that has really a huge impact statement and so just honestly 
it, it's not always the easiest to find basic beginning projects. And on the other end, <laughs> when it comes to the advanced quilter, well, the truth is, is when not many people are going to be um, spending money to purchase advanced quilting patterns because their skill level just hasn't reached that. And, and the advanced quilter, in all honesty, I think oftentimes is working so much on perfecting their latest project, it's probably not in the forefront of their mind to go, oh, let's mass produce this, let's make it available for everyone. So we tend to see the bulk of projects. And again, I think this goes across the board, across all this, the different spectrums of crafts that we have a lot of be advanced beginner and intermediate projects, but not a lot of how do I get there and where do I go afterwards? And I am not going to address where to go afterwards because I like being intermediate. <laughs> um, I, I honestly do not want to spend time getting outside of the imperfect. Um, there's other things I'd like to do that, that prevent me from worrying about if every single one of my points meet or if my gauge is correct in knitting or, or if it's even reproducible. But I like to spend time educating others and helping others get started. So as I sit here and have another rambling session, those are the things that I've been thinking about. And this meant I went on a search for my early projects, which was a lot easier to do before I moved. But <laughs> some of my earlier projects, which I love, and in my other house I had hanging on the walls, have been packaged away in boxes that I really do need to unearth and, um, and pull out to use. But with the crazy <laughs> of, of having a daughter starting a new job and, and my um, husband dealing with um, work-related snow. <laughs> and just the fact that it's January. Um, I really didn't want to ask for a lot of help to <laughs> unearth the boxes and bins that hold these things. Everything may be labeled. Everything may be where I know where to find it. But it usually takes somebody besides me to actually move everything around in order to get to it. So I do have photos and I'm going to show you some photos as we go through of some of my early, early pro projects with the theme being imperfection is still worth showing off. It's worth embracing. It's worth celebrating. Um, early beginning quilts can be loved just as much as the later ones that come along. As long as they are structurally sound, they can be a virtual hug for a person or actually not even a virtual hug. Um, when I send a quilt to my son, I'm giving him a virtual hug with a quilt that actually wraps around him like a hug. So imperfect is still some of the best hugs that we can get. So the first thing I'm going to show you is something that when I started, when I started seriously getting into patchwork quilting, and there's a key term, quilting is the process of layering together a top, usually some sort of batting or wadding and a bottom and hooking them together, sandwiching them together with quilt stitches or with yarn ties, but basically connecting them together so that the three layers, the typically three layers of fabric or fiber don't come apart. That's a, that's quilting. You can do quilting by hand. You can do quilting by machine. You can use yarn to make little tufts and ties. You can use embroidery floss. You can take little stitches and just put in touch. You can use buttons. I mean, I've done that with wall hangings. I've done that um, with projects in the past where I just put a button in each corner of, of, of each of the squares 
and hook it together that way. So quilting is by definition, the process of sandwiching it together with those stitches of either thread or yarn or buttons, whatever. Patchwork, a term that just isn't used very much right now, um, if you do a lot of searches, patchwork is the putting a whole bunch of pieces together, taking patches, taking pieces of fabric and sewing them together in a puzzle of pieces, piecing them and making the top that would then be quilted together with batting, wadding, sometimes just a flannel sheet, sometimes just attached to the back if they want a very thin um, covering that would work in hot climates. So patchwork, piecing of little patches of fabric, that is what most people go, oh, I want to get into quilting. Some people today, their whole purpose, they love doing the machine quilting. They love the way machine quilting has changed the look of the patchwork quilt. Some people love doing hand quilting. Some of the most beautiful pieces of, of, of quilting that I've seen is what's called a whole cloth quilt. If you can picture a large sheet-like piece of fabric with quilting over it, attaching it to the other layers in beautiful designs. Um, some of the beautiful ones that I've seen are um, applique patchwork. In this case, the applique, applying pieces of, of fabric onto a solid piece of fabric. So in that case, it's applied rather than patched. And of course, then we have the gorgeous, crazy patch quilts in which you don't worry about if it's geometric, it's random, sewn on top of each other. And my hands are right in front of the camera. Sorry about that. But it's, it's a beautiful example of using and oftentimes high-end fabrics. The, the, some of the, the classic ones you see are the velvets and the silks, but I have seen gorgeous, gorgeous wool crazy patch quilts in my time. A place to highlight um, hand embroidery. Um, in those cases, a lot of times you will not see them quilted in the running stitch idea of quilting, but you will see that they are tacked down, not like tied quilts, um, hidden tacked down stitches to hold the layers together um, because it stabilizes. When the back is not attached to the front, it's not as stable and it won't wear as well. So these are just a little bit of the terminology for, for the quilting. And when you get into patchwork quilting, when you get into the history of patchwork quilting, it is by nature an imperfect project. It is by nature using, unlike today where, you know, we, we buy the fabric and we make sure that the grain is all straight and we're, we're cutting strips and, and basically we're taking really brand new fabric and cutting them into pieces and then sewing them back together. Traditional patchwork quilts, they were, they were made from old clothing. And so the, they wouldn't be on straight of grain. They'd be biased all over the place. They wouldn't necessarily lay flat. And the ones that held up over time were ones that were quilted heavily enough to hold everything in place and stabilize it, but not quilted so heavily that you lose the pockets full of air that you got between the top layer and the bottom layer and that little puffs inside the quilt, that's what makes it holds the it holds the heat in it. It keeps keeps it comfortable. I have a cat that that's over here. He, he's off screen, but he is scratching the window. So I apologize. So years ago, and it's now been sorry as I adjust. <laughs> it's now been nearly 30 years since I sat down and said, 
I'm going to take the basic skills of quilting and patchwork that I learned as a, as a child from my grandmother. And I'm going to take those skills and I'm going to learn how to, to do bigger patchwork. And I watched all the PBS um, quilting that, that were on whenever I could. And I sat down and I was like, I can do this. Oh my goodness. A rotary cutter and a ruler. Wow. What a fabulous way to cut out, to cut out um, pieces. Unlike my grandma who used a uh, yardstick, a uh, pencil, and some scissors. I was like, oh, this is going to be so great. And I love all these wonderful designs drawn to all the half square triangles that make up stars, etc. Oh, I just knew I was just going to jump right in and it was going to be great. <laughs> but I had no money. I did get a rotary cutter and a small mat. And then I used my school ruler from high school <laughs> to try to cut out pieces. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I had a quarter inch seam allowance because <laughs> I didn't have accurate cutting. But I still tried. And I still learned. And I still embraced. So this is, <laughs> this is fabrics that came with me when I first got married. Remnants and scraps that my grandmother and my great aunt had given me. Also, a blue fabric, this blue fabric here, <laughs> that was my home ec in junior high, so eighth grade, my eighth grade home ec skirt. We had to use the skirt pattern that the teacher told us we had to use, and we had to make a pair of shorts, and we had to make a skirt. And it was the most abysmal <laughs> sewing experiment I've ever done because the pattern that the teacher had chosen worked really great if you were prepubescent or early pubescent, but not for someone who had already developed hips. <laughs> there, <laughs> there was no way that was ever, that skirt was ever going to look good out of 100% quilting cotton an elastic waist if you already had a woman's body. It was terrible, but I couldn't throw it away. And so it came with me. And so, of course, what am I going to try my first patchwork with a rotary cutter? I'm going to cut up my eighth grade square skirt and I'm going to make some half square triangles and it's going to be great. So, I kept the project and anyone who's done patchwork can see, especially if I come in, some of the points are missing <laughs> and that's after I learned a little bit more and then put borders on it and created this little thing. So for a long time, it was just this piece in the middle and some leftover pieces and it sat in a pile, but I eventually came back and did something with it. And on the back side is my attempt at <laughs> machine applique and couching. <laughs> whoops. <laughs> Show here. Okay. And if you come in close, whoops, here we go. Come in close. You'll see it's raw edge and it's a zigzag stitch couching down white acrylic yarn. <laughs> so, the early beginnings. <laughs> ah, the wonders of youth. But I keep this, and I keep this handy even when I packed and moved. I keep this handy. I keep this with my choicest heirlooms, with the things that are. Um, baby sweaters of my husband's, of mine, from when we were babies. I keep this with the most delicate heirlooms because this reminds me and it helps me teach others that we all have to start somewhere. <laughs> and there 
is joy in imperfection. <laughs> so that's where I started. <laughs> I began to understand in working on that, that I needed to have at least a good, um, uh, a good six inch ruler, six by 24 is what I started with. So I think when a birthday came up or, you know, an anniversary or something, you know, and, and back in those days, I mean, it really was. Okay, so I won't buy any yummy cheeses this week. Instead, I'm going to buy, or this month, and instead I'm going to buy a nice um, uh, ruler. I remember those days really well. And that's one of the reasons why in subsequent years, I've tried to create patterns for, for beginners that they do not need a rotary cutter. They, they do not need the mats. It serves two purposes. Beginners who are on a really tight budget and small children benefit from really simple patchwork ideas. So, but I moved from there and I, I got a rotary cut, or I got the rotary, a, a little bit larger rotary cutter mat and I did get two, um, two quilting rulers. One that was a six inch by 24 and one that was a 12 by 12. And <laughs> I also, with my husband right at my side supporting me, <laughs> bought um, Eleanor Burns Quilt in a Day Flying Geese Pattern. We loved it because we loved the colors. It was blues and purples and it was just beautiful. And we found fabrics very similar to what, um, what the book looked like. And I think I'll try to put a picture here. And my husband said, so you think you can make this? And I was like, yes, I can make this. This, I've been watching enough of her program. I can do this. If I have the rulers, I have the rotary cutter, I can do this. And I did. I made a king size flying geese quilt. We, after I pieced it all together, we laid it out in my mother-in-law's basement on her thick pile rug, shag rug, not pile, shag rug, using gigantic safety pins because I thought, ooh, the bigger the safety pin, the less I have to pin. Not the way to go. <laughs> Those safety pins <laughs> are gigantic. They put holes in the, the, the quilt and they didn't work as well as uh, the, the wonderful safety pins of today. Um, the bent the bent safety pins that we use. But we, we went down into the basement, we stretched, we, we vacuumed the floor, we stretched the quilt out we pin based it together, trying not to pin the quilt to the shag carpet. <laughs> the basement was poorly lit. So, I mean, uh, and then I started quilting it. I had a wooden um, oval hoop that could be on a stand, but I just, I'd, I'd hoop a section, I'd sit down and I did it in my lap. And I think it took me about a year to hand quilt that quilt the memories of doing that. Um, there are times that I really remember how it was, it saved me. It saved me from a lot of turmoil and grief and upset that, that might have swamped me. Um, I learned in, in, that, in that process of making that quilt, that hand quilting that quilt, that when the world gets hard, when there are trying times, that sitting down with a quilt in my lap was giving myself the hug that I needed. I have one picture that I could find as I, I prepared this of that quilt, and I'll share it. It is, I still have the center section of it. Um, it is threadbare, it's worn, color is faded. And when my daughter got ready to enter the Peace Corps and go to Mongolia, um, we decided to send that, that with her. Because if it didn't make it back, it was okay. It had seen its time. It had been used. It had been, it was threadbare. What I learned is that if you, that the outer borders of a quilt can wear, um, especially if 
it's being used by a military man with very short, short haircut and whiskers. Um, short hair and whiskers shred quilts <laughs> if the person who is sleeping under him likes to snuggle. So that quilt, the borders were way too worn thin. So I ended up cutting out, cutting all the borders off and just putting a new binding on it. But in order for it to go to Mongolia, it needed some patches placed over and some extra quilting to stabilize. And when my daughter was in Mongolia and winter set in and they actually went under quarantine long before um, COVID became a thing because there had been a bad flu that had come through. My daughter sat in her, her yurt, her gear, and she added patches over the top of the threadbare pieces and she hand quilted to stabilize the worn pieces and when she returned um, being evacuated she brought it with her and it's now permanently gray from the coal dust it is again just threadbare beyond belief but she is still applying patches of scraps of fabric that she ended up getting in, in um, thrift bins in Mongolia. And she's making that, and it's now, it has so much more memory for her. It, it has so much more attachment. So it is, it was far from perfect when I made it. It is far from perfect now, but it is loved. So what I wanted to do when I came today was I wanted to talk about how, um, how we start and how we need to embrace and love that imperfect, that imperfect quilt, that imperfect scarf, that imperfect beginning project. And maybe it's imperfect because we've been quilting for quite some time, but we're trying a new technique we've never um, tried before. Trust me, if I sit down and do a double wedding ring or a drunkard's path, patchwork block, there will be some imperfection. My daughter has done the drunkard's path and, and things of that nature, but I haven't done curves for quite some time and it was never anything that I really did. So if I embark on making something like that, it's going to be imperfect. But I'm going to show you a quilt that started out relatively perfect. But then the red fabric on the backing bled through to the front because I had stitched down a matching red sleeve for the wall hanging. Everywhere that didn't have the sleeve was perfectly fine, no bleeding. But where there was the extra layers of the red fabric on the back, it bled through and stained the quilting stitches at the top of the quilt. From a distance, from the three foot rule, you can't see it. But when you get up close, you could see it. And I knew it bugged me. And it's just, a, it's a wall hanging. So I thought, okay, how do we, what are we gonna, where, how are we gonna play with this? So I painted it. <laughs> and I have painted fabric before, but I haven't really actually painted a finished quilt before. <laughs> And like little kids with finger paints and such, I had a lot of fun. And then I found some other imperfections in my painting. So I had some more fun. <laughs> I put more paint on it. And then I put hot crystals, you know, hot, hot glue crystals on it. And it is nothing at all like I had started out with. Nothing at all like I envisioned with my red and white Valentine's wall hanging. But it has joy. It works in its own way. So I will share that with you because, <laughs> because you have to enjoy it. You have to laugh at it. You have to embrace things don't always go right. And when those things don't always go right, then adjust. And one of the best ways of dealing with cutoff points is put buttons over them. <laughs> so I hope that my rambling um, 
and showing you a few of the quilts because I'm sure that I, I have all this time. I will be popping up whatever quilts I feel like might go along with this um, and, and I'll be sharing it. But that brings me to the second part. So we deal with, we all, all have to start somewhere as a beginner. We have to acknowledge the fact that there is imperfection. But the second part is we have to have somewhere to start. Patchwork looks really easy. And for someone who has been sewing a great deal in their life, it's just a matter of learning a new technique. I think patchwork is a wonderful way of actually teaching someone how to sew because you're sewing together straight lines. Whereas with clothing, it's curves and all sorts of things. It's straight lines. So I like to teach patchwork as a way to get accustomed to a sewing machine, a way to get into sewing. But if you've been sewing for a long time, now it's just a matter of learning how to cut out the pieces accurately how to sew them together with a different type of seam allowance and how to press rather than iron the pieces so that they will lay flat once they've been sewn. That sounds easy. That looks easy when you watch it on a video, but it is not necessarily easy. It is, it becomes more and more difficult the more intricate and the smaller your patches, your pieces are. Some people have the mindset, the brain wave, the thinking, the normal behavior that, that they can sit down and do this and right off the bat, they can have extreme accuracy. Other people, they can try for years and still have it not very technically sound, sound as far as structurally sound but the techniques just can elude them. Sometimes I think it just is the way our, our brains are wired. Sometimes I think it's about what we prioritize. And if I want just a, a wonderful, warm, scrunchy you know, quilt, I'm not gonna sit there and nitpick if the point, I'm gonna show, if the point, here we go, here we go, is slightly off, okay? I am, going to question when entire, um, I'm looking to see if there's one that, yeah, when, when, when entire chunks are missing. <laughs> so getting started, it, it's not, no one, no one starts on the same playing field because people bring with them to patchwork their own experiences, their own desire for perfection versus, um, desire for joy and having fun. Some people find more joy in having a much more technically perfect um, item. I get joy from finger painting. So I'm going to probably always have um, imperfect piecing. I remember Eleanor Burns once said in um, an interview that when she sews a seam and it matches up, perfect point, she'll show it to the camera. When she sews a, sews a she seam, there's a tongue twister. When she sews a seam on camera that doesn't match up perfectly, she just moves on to the next one. And I love that. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. It doesn't matter what your experience is. We're going to have times in which it just doesn't work out. In which case, put some bling on it. Have fun with it. Sew some beads paint it, have fun. But it, it brings me to what I plan on doing in this upcoming year. And I'm going to use this video as a long talking to whoever wanted to actually listen to me as they, I don't know, as they knit, as they sew, as they just have noise in the background. I, I want to, in the, in 2021, pick up from a, a project that, um, some projects I'd started in the past. Years ago, I, put together some basic quilt or basic patchwork patterns to help people get started. And I did it as a samplers and some of them were easier to reproduce than others. Um, but it was just, it was something I, I did. 
and I thought about that and I was like, well, what I'd really like to do is now do a video showing, or a, a series of videos showing, highlighting a basic patchwork block. And then that basic patchwork block put in a layout for a baby quilt. I tend to go with baby quilts because they're short, they're easy to do in my lap, and someone is always having a baby, so I don't have to have them stack up somewhere. Um, so I want to do these in showing off a patchwork block, a traditional patchwork block, and then in a layout that shows how they can be done. And when I started going through and creating the ones that I wanted to do, I realized everything I was doing um, in the first set of these, the first, I think, five or six that I was doing, that they're all technically a nine patch. In some cases, I, and I have a feeling I'll be putting pictures up here because I have the computer generated ones, but they're all technically a nine patch. A nine patch is when you have three across and three down in a nine block grid. Well, baby quilts that I do can also be in a nine patch. The quilt that I've already shown with the hearts that I painted over is a nine patch. It has three blocks across, three blocks down and filled in the middle and it's nine patches. But you can also do a nine patch that is technically four large blocks separated by sashing and a sashing square in the center. Because a patch is a patch as a patch. A block is a block. It's terminology. So you can use nine patch blocks in a nine patch quilt. You can use nine patch blocks separated by strips of sashing, which technically are skinny blocks. You can do a nine patch block and separate them by another type of a block. Like um, one of my favorites is the one that I call um, trip around the block or another one of my favorites is um, its name is new um, new hope twist. Okay. So you can offset your nine patch blocks with these other types of very simple patchwork blocks. And I realized that if I want to leave patterns for my posterity, maybe I should leave videos for my posterity as well. And if I'm going to make a video, might as well share them with my audience out there, my small audience, but my, my audience nonetheless. And so that's what I'm going to be going about doing in 2021. When I do a small video showing specifically one of these quilt, um, my, um, I will be doing a quilt block made into a uh, 22 um, by 22 inch pillow top. Um, when I do one of these videos, I will be putting on my blog a PDF of the free pattern. Um, it is not my intention ever to be trying to um, make money off this. That's not what this is about. I want to I want to be able to answer the question when somebody types in a Facebook group or so any kind of um, social media group, when somebody types the question, where do I start? I want to have a specific answer. Here's an idea of where to start. Understanding the difference between quilting and patchwork. Quilting is making a quilt, but quilting is also the sewing together the layers. Patchwork is making a quilt, is making a patchwork quilt, but it's also piecing together all the pieces that make the patchwork. And when people start to understand that it doesn't take complicated math, that there's simple formulas, simple ways of doing this, that, that, that if you're really on a budget, you can do this. You can do this well. 
if you're not on a budget, you can still do this well. I totally support people who are making their, their livelihood on making patterns. I do not want to draw attention away from them or compete with them. I value their contribution to this world. But we sometimes forget where we came from. We sometimes forget how we start, what we start. And I want to make sure that when I'm asked, where do I start? What do I start with? I have an answer. So thank you for paying attention to me as I've rambled on. Um, I will probably be putting together a short video of my imperfect painted <laughs> Valentine's quilt <laughs> and posting it as well. I will create a, pay a playlist so that these can go into them because I will also be trying to come back with some spinning. I do have some um, blending of fibers I need to be doing and some spinning I need to be doing. And so if you do subscribe and you follow me, whether you are a quilter or your spinner or knitter, I do try, I will try to have playlists and ways that can help you sort through. I hope that you're all having a wonderful new year. I hope that the, the struggle that we have with um, COVID, political unrest, um, separation from family, um, and in too many cases, the loss of loved ones. I hope that none of this is preventing you from finding joy and peace in the new year, in the new beginnings, in the new, the newness of every day. I know that there are times I go to bed with a heavy heart, but with the hopeful knowledge that the new day will bring something that will cause me to smile. And it is my wish for you that in this new year, every day can be something, can be a day where you wake up with a smile and that as you go to bed at night you can know there was joy even if it was hard fought so best wishes and we will be back again soon with another unwinding with fiber and fabric have a great day